today was a big day for you. You made a decision to bronze those cliques after 11 years in the NFL. You know what, man? 11 seasons, six championship games, three Super Bowls, and two Super Bowl wins. Man, I did everything I, I set out to do on the field. What's going on? It's Keyshawn, and welcome to my show, Undisputed Presents All Facts, No Breaks. And joining me today is a former Rutgers standout, 11-year NFL veteran and two-time Super Bowl champion with the New England Patriots, Logan Ryan. What's up, Logan? What's going on, man? Man, nothing. It was a big day. And, and by the way, my son, Keyshawn Jr., also joins us on the show. So How you doing? Nice he sits you behind too. the camera over there, <laughs> twiddling his thumbs. Check him out. Um... <laughs> Today was a big day for you. You made a decision to bronze those cliques after 11 years in the NFL. Threw them up on the wire. How, how did you come to that conclusion? Man, that's a great that's a great question, a question I'm going to be asked a lot today and probably going forward. I just think um, you got to feel when it's time. And I, don't, I don't think we're really trained to know when it's time. I think we're trained to kind of get in this league, fight to be in this league, think about you know how to stay in the league, but you're not really – trained or prepared on how to get out the league. And I think for me, I was in a position, one, to retire financially. Mm. I made I made my bread. I saved my bread. I was smart with it. I took care of my family, but I was smart with my bread in, in a way that I didn't need to play anymore. So I had a dis I was in the ability to make decisions, mm -hmm. right, with financial freedom. And then I kind of looked as a guy that always loved being a great father, loved being a husband. I loved um, training around my kids' schedule. And now my kids are getting older. They got sports every day and I want to be there. And mm -hmm. I, I saw LeBron had a quote the other day that greatness is just like sacrifice all the time. And I was sacrificing some things, missing some things. I want to be there for my kids. So I didn't want to play for certain teams that are too far away from home for me, which was Tampa, um, and live without my kids for a year. I was tired of having them switch schools. So all those decisions led to me say, you know what, man, 11 seasons, six championship games, three Super Bowls, and two Super Bowl wins. Man, I did everything I, I set out to do on the field. So 11, 11 seasons, you played with the Patriots, the Titans, the Giants, the Bucks, and the 49ers. You beat me by one team, but that's okay. <laughs> um, how was that, though, bouncing around from state to state, city to city? Yeah. Different teams, different head coaches, different locker rooms. How, how, how did you take that on? I think every everyone was a different challenge. Um uh, and I try to make the boast, the best of it and see and see the positive side of it. I think it's it's the stress and strain it puts on your wife and kids of having, you know, my daughter was at three different schools in three years going to third grade. Different COVID for kindergarten. First grade was different. Second grade was a different state. Third grade. I'm like, man, I, this is like raising a child when you're in the military. Like, I got to find a way to find stability for them, a way to find a base. And uh, that's when I said, I'm not going to move her anymore. Um, if a team calls me or if I go to a team, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go and live without my family. I didn't have... Tons of joy living out my without my kids every day either. So it was tough. When I was in New England, I got drafted there, right? I won Super Bowls there. I learned how to be a pro there. Um, that was cool. I left to Tennessee in free agency. New England doesn't always pay their players and go to free agency. And sometimes you got to do what you got to do to set your family up for financial freedom. So I did that. Um, was able to go to New York where I'm from, New Jersey. They would go home and Joe Judge, they had some Patriot coaches that I want to bring me in, be a leader, be a captain for that team. And I was able to do that. And that, and that was cool. And then, um, new G we don't win. New GM comes in, new coach comes in. What happens? They clean house. I clean, I got cleaned out part of that. I just signed an extension, got all my money from it. And I was able to go back to Tampa where I had a house. Mm -hmm. Boom. So once I'm in Tampa, I'm set. I'm like, okay, this is a perfect right off. I'll play with Brady again. And then I broke my foot, uh, you know, week four of the season. And it was like, man, okay. I never really had an injury where I lift, lost a lot of time in a season pretty much missed most of my year, came back for the playoffs, um, got bounced out. And I didn't like how that went. So um, I was pretty much good last season. Then that's when the 49ers called me. I was on a cruise on Thanksgiving. <laughs> Haven't really been training. I was on a cruise. I was getting ready to retire last year. Shanahan called me on a cruise. I left the cruise ship, ended up starting for the 49ers two weeks later, ended up starting the Super Bowl, starting the playoff runs. And uh, that showed me my ability to really know this game and play. Yeah. And I can still do that, but it also was like, man, I can't keep doing this 
for too much longer and I got to make the best decision for my family. See, Keyshawn, you thought you was the only kid in America that went to like 14 different schools in three years. His kids did the same thing. I think I went to like 11 yeah. and by the time I was 11. Yeah, yeah you, got, you got your beat. Got well, your beat. because off season, I'd go back. To train uh, somewhere. Yeah, so it's yeah. like they had to go with me up until the point where they got a little bit older and then I just said, you know what, man, I'm going to just stay in Carolina by myself. Y'all just come on the weekends, right. you know, and, and come to the games. And then after the games, y'all fly home for school. That was basically yeah. the routine. Yeah. No, I mean, I remember I had my family up in New Jersey when I just got released from the Giants. And I just signed at the Bucks. I was going to OTAs because I was new. I want to learn the scheme. And I was on the same flight every Sunday night to fly down to Florida, yeah. to go to OTAs Monday to Thursday, and then back on Thursday. The same flight for 12 weeks in a row, 24 flights, like bang, bang. Same crew, same staff, same pilot. I'm <laughs> dapping them up. Let's go. And it was cool. And then after like, you know, six, seven weeks, now you got delays. Now you now the, the flight ain't getting out on time. And you just spend all this time in the airport. And, and I think, that, you know, people don't see all that that goes into it, right? For us uh -huh. to play the 17 games, a lot goes in all year. So like a lot like me, I'm from Southern California here in Los Angeles. I went to USC, the, the real USC, the Trojans. And I was born and raised. You born and raised in New Jersey, New York area, the tri-state. Yeah. And you wind up going to Ruc Rutgers. Yeah. What was that like being able to be a top-notch high school football player in your home state, but then also go to Rutgers and stay at home for your people to see you play? Yeah, I think that was huge. And a lot of people ask me, man, why'd you go to Rutgers, right? And the funny thing is, when Rutgers was recruiting me, that's when they had Ray Rice, Kenny Britt, the McCourty Twins. They were number two in the nation when they had that team. And that's when I started getting recruited by them. So they were just as good as any school recruiting me. So the fact I was able to stay close to home and they had the Twins, and I knew the Twins were going to graduate soon. I can come in and play in 07, 08. I came in in 09. So they recruited my sophomore, junior year of high school. So I really follow those McCourty twins, man. And, and I've been following them all along. I've been playing with uh with Devin and obviously in New England, followed their shoes at Rutgers, got drafted. They really paved the way of what's possible for a kid out, for, out there. And then, um, you know, I really signed to Tennessee to play with Jason. Jason was Tennessee's corner. And the day I signed, let's tell you the NFL, the day I signed there, I show up the first day from OTAs and he, he got released. He was leaving <laughs> with a trash bag. I, I was like, oh, I felt terrible. I felt terrible. So he had to go to Cleveland. He went 0-16. And then he ended up going to New England and got my locker in New England. So we switched places. He got a ring in New England. I was down in Tennessee doing my thing. So that's how this league works. But I always lead on the McCourty Twins, man, because they've always, as you see now on TV, they've always made smart moves. So in 2013, you were drafted by the New England Patriots. You were 83rd overall. Yeah. Did you have any, like, inkling that, okay, here I am, the second round's gone, third round, New England's going to take me? Or, did, or you, at that point, you just like, man, I don't give a damn who take me. I'm yeah. just ready to go. Man, I was... Look, it's not as bad as a guy sliding like to the seven. I'm grateful for it, but I was I was pre I was pretty frustrated on draft night. I left as a, a a junior, so I left early, and I got a second round draft grade. I went to the combine. I didn't run it super fast. I ran a four five. I'm not a super combine athlete type of guy, but I came out of Rutgers all American. I came out you know all conference two years in a row. I covered. I traveled with number one receivers. I had like, I see these corner stats coming out. These guys have like 90 tackles and three picks their whole career. I had 90 tackles, 20 PBUs and four picks just my junior year. So I was like, man, I had, you know, so I, my numbers were insane, okay, but, yeah. but I had no comb. I didn't do well at the combine. I had no senior bowl to show it. Right. So I had nowhere to really show. I just kind of was sliding. And then these guys kind of jumping ahead of me, jumping ahead. I'm like, that guy. <laughs> right. And me and oh, me the and the uh, draft. Right. The draft. So only the only DB I really was like, this guy is doing it is Honey Badger. Yeah. I was Honey Badger. Here. That was a guy that I was really like trying to keep up with. And we had Slay as well. And Slay's a dog. No knock on Slay. Um, he, he's definitely great. But um, a bunch of DBs got drafted ahead of all of us. But guess where they at now, though? Right, they're watching this. A lot of them this. dudes was at home fast, though. <laughs> yeah, they were. That happens every single year, they man. They were, they were. So, yeah, I'm grateful New England got me. Bill knows what he's doing. Um, and he drafted my college roommate, Deron Harmon, in the third round right with me. So me and my boy got to play together. He's a safety. I'm a corner. So we got to play together and link up for another four years. Yeah, I go through this process every single year with cats that get drafted. You know, they say, well... You was the number one overall pick, man. How you get... I said, man, just chill. <laughs> it's, it's all right now in this 48-hour time period, you're going to stress out. You're going to pull right. your hair out. Right. But the moment that you be able to put that hat on, 
that say New England Patriots, man, you're going to forget about it. everybody else and you're going to be so happy, man. No I doubt. tell them that every single year. I go through this every year with somebody. I went through with my nephew. He went in the second round. I told him, I said, man, all them Treadwells and all them, them dudes ain't going to be nowhere to be seen in three years. Yeah, true. They ain't going to be seen in three years. That's yeah. just the reality of it. Spoken like a number one pick over here. You know, that's yeah. just the reality of it, though. <laughs> no, that, that, no, Logan, hey. for real, though, because what happens is, like you explained to me, you says, well, my statistics, I'm supposed to go high. Just, it's like, no, that's not what they're looking at. They're yeah. not... There's guys that had better numbers than me my year to draft. Yeah. But they didn't have an impact on the game the same way. Yeah. They was playing against different competition. Yeah. It wasn't playing against big time competition. Yeah. They was up messing around catching for 160 balls in one right. college season. And you're like, they not, they not yeah. like that. Yeah. And, but it, it, it eventually, you know, the cream always rises yeah. to the top. Well, here, here's the truth about you, Keyshawn, and the truth about it is, like, you can play ball, though. Yeah, that's all and that matters. Like, and, like, when you study a craft and you work on your craft, like, like these guys can't play ball, right? So then I'm at the combine, right? Guy runs, jumps 40. Yeah. Guy, guy runs 4-3. I see him backpedal. He backpedal like a, <laughs> a high school linebacker. Feet wide as this. I'm like, oh, he can't cover? No. He don't know what he's doing at the line of scrimmage. He can't turn his head around high point no football. Oh, that dude can't And he play. probably eventually. But he's rising. Yeah. Somebody, an analyst, is saying that he's a riser. and He's like, this dude can't play, though. But we don't know. And the, beauty, the beauty about the NFL, and I tell everyone this, um, if you don't love the game, you don't do it the right, game, the right way, the game will humble you at the NFL. Absolutely. They do not care. They will find it. They will expose you quickly. You could sign a new deal, and you'll be out of that deal in two years. The NFL, like no other league, will humble you, and the cream will rise to the top. No question about it. What was it like playing for Coach Belichick, the time that you had and you spent with him? Yeah, I mean, I definitely got Belichick earlier in my career, so I didn't know any, like, different. You know, it was definitely a lot of discipline, a lot of... But, man, he is so smart in a way to simplify the game for us. Like, he made the game seem so simple of what I want you to do. Logan, I don't want you to worry about that. Just don't let this guy beat you outside. Yeah. And Devin's got you inside. And I don't care how many interceptions you have or who or what Darrell Revis is doing over there. We are doubling this guy, period. And... We didn't really, you know, there was no ego in the sense of saying, man, I want to cover him one-on-one. -on -one. It was like, all right, let's just double him. Let's just win by 40. What we sweating about? Like, I think we had like no 100-yard receiver in my four years there. We took guys away. And I believe a lot of teams should play like that. Why would you let another team's best player or a guy that sets the rhythm of their offense, you know, kind of, why would you let another offense get in rhythm? We were so great at taking away offense's rhythm. And I thought he, he was a genius in his simplicity of explaining that. Yeah, I had to... Uh you know, he was my defensive coordinator with the Jets. Yeah. So I had the privilege to sit in the meetings with him, you know, probably every Friday we would sit, or was it Saturday? It was Saturday or Friday. We would sit in a meeting for about an hour and a half, maybe even two hours, going over some bullshit film <laughs> on a two-minute package because right. I was a safety in our two-minute. Oh. <laughs> and so we like, dude, they only going to run – Four plays here. Yeah. But he would go all the way back to wherever that coach who's calling the plays. Yeah. And I'm talking about, man, I seen stuff that was like ancient history Rain. 10 years ago. <laughs> he show, I'm like, Bill. Yeah, he's going to show some. And true enough, he went all the way back to, I don't remember who the offensive coordinator was, but we were playing the Jaguars in the, in the division around playoff game. And I remember him saying, now look, they're going to go three by one over here. And when he does this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, all right. And it worked. I got a pick. <laughs> and so, you know, AG he, and my, the other DBs, all they was bad. Because yeah, yeah. they wanted me to just bat the ball yeah, down. Yeah, bat it down. No, I you, took you it. You were the jumper. Yeah, I got it. I'm like, oh, I got it. I, this is mine. Y'all Y'all yeah. be quiet. You know, Mark is coming all of them. I tell me, y'all be quiet. I got this. This is mine. Yeah, yeah, my yeah. I'm the jumper. Y'all so, box, box out. Are you surprised that he's not coaching this year? Just not the New England Patriots in the league in general. Yeah, I was surprised by that. I definitely think he was one of, you know, the better coaches available on the cycle. Vrabel as well. You know, I played with Vrabel, but I definitely think that um, times are changing. The league are looking for more offensive-minded guys, looking for guys that are quarterback develop, the quarterback developers um, now, and maybe they just feel like Belichick's way. They're not sure if they're willing to change uh, so much about the organization for what he needs. I don't know what he's requiring because I know in New England he had a lot of roster control and a lot of power. That I don't know what he was asking for or whatnot, but for pound for pound as a coach, he's definitely one of the best available. So you 
spent two seasons with the Giants in 2020, 2021. Mm. And you grew up in South Jersey, yeah. which is a little further away from New York than what most people think, closer to PA, yeah. closer to, to, to Philly. Yeah. Did you grow up an Eagles fan at all? Or are you? Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I did grow up an Eagles fan. So I why go up, to the Giants? I grew up. I mean, it was <laughs> the Eagles didn't offer me the Eagles didn't offer me a contract. Oh, okay. I had, you know what I'm saying? So, um, but it's funny when I got there because I know how that rivalry is, man. That's like SEC football up there for people like NFL, NFC East football is football up there is is pro football is big, and you got to decide. Like, there's no tiptoeing, and it's 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 Giants and it's Eagles, and everyone hates the Cowboys up there. Period. So it's a good thing I didn't go to the Cowboys. But when I went up there, they said, "Oh, did you grow up?" You know, I know you're from Jersey. You grew up a Giants fan. I'm like, man, I'm a fan of the NFC East. I've been, I've been watching these battles my whole I never answered. I just said I'm a fan of the NFC East. But yeah, I grew up, I did grow up an Eagles fan. I grew up watching McNabb and Brian Dawkins and Jeremiah Trotter and David Akers was the kicker, man. I can name almost everyone on the roster. But I grew up watching oh, so football. you didn't like me then. I mean, you had, you definitely had some ways, you know. Yeah, you didn't of, like me because uh, I used to terrorize the Eagles. Yeah, Lito Shepard and, uh, and the and, boys. And Brown and, and Shelton Brown. I mean, I got to look. Doc no, probably, Lito them, I mean, Doc probably got good. you one time. No, oh, dog didn't do nothing but talk. <laughs> oh, That's yeah. all. He diving on piles. He, he a crawled, JOP dude. He crawled out the tunnel. No, he go crawl out the tunnel. <laughs> Funny story though. I don't know. We're in Philadelphia. Yeah, we were in. We were in Philly, and he came out with the whole. That's my boy too. He came out with the whole. Uh, the 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 cartoon that whatever the stuff the Wolverine, is. Wolverine. Yeah, the Wolverine mask Wolverine Weapon X. deal. He doing all the Wolverine stuff. That's the Logan X Weapon X name. Doing Logan. all that right. Yeah. So I catch him. At the, you know, I'm standing on the sideline and he come past our bench or whatever. I said, man, you need to stop with all of those <laughs> fake ass WWE bullshit. Nobody want to hear all that. Come play football. <laughs> he just was like, oh, you be just my house. I said, man, you need to go. Play. You need to do wrestling. That's what you need to do. Yeah, he's speaking now, in it, tugs. Now, the Eagle fans, Eagle fans are, are interesting. When I was um, getting divorced from Keyshawn's Bob. It, it's the best. <laughs> smooth, smooth transition. No, but I don't know the Eagle fans. I'm getting divorced from the mother. The whole stadium is screaming, where's your wife? Oh, wow. We at the yeah. vet. We get ready to go to the that. Super Bowl. We beat them, and they going crazy. They worried about what my wife was at. Yeah, they But don't. it was fun, though. It they, was it was a lot of fun. They, do their, they do their research over there. Boy. No, they definitely... They it's a great transition. It's okay. He's grown now. <laughs> no, yeah, that's funny to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, you played for the Bucks in 2022 where you were reunited with your former teammate, Tom Brady. What was it like being teammates with him? Man, I, I love Tom Brady, man, in a sense of um, just be able to, you know, when I got there as a rookie, he was, I mean, his prime was a long time, you know, and he was definitely in, in the middle of it. And I just saw greatness every day, bro. I just like playing with Jordan. I just saw greatness. He set the tone every practice, just his work ethic. And I just studied it. And I remember being like, bro, like he was there every day early. You know, I know there's stories about it every day. I'm like, bro, what time do you get here? You just like, you just got to get here earlier and find out. And I'll get there earlier and earlier, you know, 5.30 a.m., 5.15 a.m., 5 a.m. I was never going before 5 a.m. That was crazy to me to wake up at 4. And um, it'd always be It'll be Brady, Belichick, and Julian Edelman's car. I was a fourth car in New England for four years. Because back then, there's no parking spots for New England. It's whoever first come, first serve. So you, mm -hmm. you could see by the, the spots who, who got there. And Tom Brady's in the middle of year 14, year 15, getting there at five, I got four, in, four in the morning every day. And I saw that. And then, you know, I played against him in Tennessee. Um, so I got to play with him, got to play against him in the playoffs a couple times in Tennessee. And then I got to play with him again at the end of his career in Tampa and, and just seeing... Um, him with his kids and his kids growing up, me having kids. Now I kind of was more of a grown man level with him, yeah. more of a peer, as opposed to looking up at him, kind of was a peer like, hey, we need to go do this together. We got to lead these guys together. So I kind of grew up alongside him, his leadership style, man. He's taught me a lot, so much I can I can never really repay him for. You know, it's so funny how everybody prepares. You know, you hear people coming in at four in the morning, three yeah. in the morning. I was the last one in the yeah. building <laughs> and the last one out the building. Spoken I would be like the, the you know, they say, hey, pick. they say, hey, we got to be here at eight. I come in at 745, practice is over. I'm there till 10 o'clock at night. I'm like not leaving early, but some yeah, people yeah, yeah. Yeah, would come early. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I'm not waking up at five o'clock yeah. in the morning to go mess around. I don't have to. I'd rather stay later so yeah. I can see all the film and I could do everything because in the morning time, I'm like, I'd rather sleep in. Yeah. But everybody, everybody just does it a little bit different depending on, I guess there's so many different ways to skin a cat. I mean, you know, Belichick, our practices were hard in New England. Hard. 
Like there was years. I mean, y'all didn't even have two a days there in training was, camp. Man, it was still <laughs> he still found a way to get on that hill every day. We were still squatting heavy. <laughs> so there was Bill made it made it known like nothing's more important to your development than practice. Yeah. Like meetings is cool. This is cool. Man, practice is where we're gonna find out who's gonna play. Cause it was competition every day. Yeah. You know, as it should be. So in training camp, we practiced in the mornings. So I wanted to get there early, get my lift in, get my body ready to go in the day. So mentally, I can kind of shut it down after, you know, kind of be in my slides the rest of the day, just do recovery and get out to see my kids or whatever, you know, after, you know, when camp would get done or after practice or whatever. So I wanted to be up and at them so I can kind of 9 a.m. We, we got to hit. I got to hit somebody. I'm ready to go. They still waking up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you played 11 seasons and you hit the postseason, eight of those 11 seasons. You played in postseason games. Yeah. And you've seen all sorts of quarterbacks, and you played, obviously, with Tom Brady and then Tanny Hill and a couple others along the way. But you just recently played with Brock Purdy. Yeah. Be honest with me, though. I ain't going to get you in trouble. I just want to know. <laughs> is he here to stay? Or is, or is everybody still waiting for the, the shoe to drop and him to turn back into a pumpkin? <laughs> nah, he's here to stay. I think they're going to give him a bag, too. No, for sure they're going to give yeah, him a bag. They're going to have think, to. Big bag. Yeah, no, nah, he's going to be like one of the highest paid. People, people are going to be shocked. Like, what? He's going to be talking about that forever. But um, nah, he's here to stay. Shanahan loves him. Like, true, true. Like, I got there a week or so before we played Baltimore on Christmas. Remember that game? And he threw four picks. Yeah. And a lot of those picks were tip balls. You know, I mean, they're interceptions. Yeah, you can't do that. Yeah, it, was discount, like, it was just a bad day. I always discount right, it's quarterbacks a bad day, and interceptions. You know? If somebody yeah. throws 15, he had a really corner blitz. Seven. He went to throw it one corner, tipped it up to the other corner. Like, yeah. that was crazy. So it's just a bad day. You know, a bad day at work. He didn't play great. But like, he had three picks or whatever in the first half or third quarter. He's in the fourth quarter still stepping in, still slinging it, like still trying to throw the ball, trying to win a game. And Shanahan said, I remember in the meeting, he's like, I've coached a lot of quarterbacks. When quarterbacks have three or four interceptions, they're trying to check it down, protect, they, protect, you know, get out of there, get out of dodge, not trying to take no more hits. He still stayed like kind of in his progression, but kind of had this gunfire about him, this, this dog about him. And he always would ask me questions about Brady and stuff like that. And in the playoffs, I think you saw like, the 49ers were a team that's used to playing ahead. In the, in the playoffs, we got behind a bunch. And Purdy was coming in the second half, going to get it, making plays happen with his feet, with his arm. He's got this dog ability about him on top of the processing. I think he processes like a Kirk Cousins. But he also has this dog in him, though, that I don't think people fully see, but he does it to win games over there. Which one of the receivers in San Francisco is harder to defend? Ayuk or, or Jennings or Debo? We had we had Demo uh, on the podcast before the Super Bowl, and he said it was Ayuk, the Amador Lenore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Ayuk. It's Ayuk um, because his route running is definitely the best of the three. Like he's crispy, fast, electric. But like, well, all three of them, like what Debo does with the ball after he gets it, is just special. That's world class special. And what Jennings does, boy, that blocking, like the the forty nine. The reason why Ayuk deserves to get paid is because of route running and all that stuff. Like Keenan Allen-ish, a little more speed. But, dude, this dude's blocking, too. Blocking, blocking. Like, I like playing number of receivers that don't block. That's the easy day for me that don't block, right? I can tell if it's runner pass. They subbing out every two plays. I'm like, all right, they ain't getting the ball. The ball ain't coming this way. They, they don't bring a backup receiver in to go catch a pass on one play. They're running the ball. Ayuk staying in the whole game. Yeah. And he's blocking dudes 70 yards downfield. And he's blocking guys to the Gatorade cooler with Jennings and Debo. So those guys are asked to block, and he's also running high-quality routes and catching the ball when he's targeted. So I think all that, that's a guy that I would pay because he plays the position every single down. So episode nine of Patriots documentary, The Dynasty, featured the mystery of your former teammate Malcolm Butler only playing one snap in Super Bowl 51. Mm. Let's watch this clip. In the 2017 season, Malcolm Butler played 98% of the snaps. Why was he only on the field for one play during the Super Bowl? Yeah, Matt, we've talked about that. I didn't ask you about it. What has been told to me is that there was something personal going on between Bill and Malcolm that was not football related. What were your thoughts when you heard Malcolm would not be playing? I was a star with Malcolm the, the, the previous two years. And I tell you to this day, nobody, I don't know. Does I, he know? 
I don't. He never told me. And Devin Did he sign an NDA or something? I don't know. Because by nobody, now, I'll be like, no, yo. No, nobody, nobody truly knows, bro. I I will say this, though. Uh, I'm in Tennessee that year. Um, them boys just went back to another Super Bowl. So we had beat Atlanta the year before. I, went, I left free agency. Malcolm was, um, you know, still there. And they were playing Philly. And he called me that like he FaceTime me. He never FaceTimes me. He FaceTime me like the Friday or Saturday before the game. Like, you know, playoff week two, like, or Super Bowl, like you got two weeks of prep. That yeah. I, that is just walkthroughs. Yeah. Like, you're not, you're not really nothing news happening. And he FaceTime me. And I didn't, I didn't answer, I didn't, I was on my phone. I called him back. He's like, just pick up. He's like, man, forget it, forget it. I'm good. And he's hung up. And it was really like frantic. I'm like, what the heck is going on with Malcolm? Like, game's tomorrow. Then I saw him crying during the national anthem. And I'm like, oh, that's not good. I said, they, I said, I hope they don't mess with Malcolm. And then he didn't play. So, but he never told me. I, I was his teammate in Tennessee after. He never mm -hmm. told me. Um, Did you ask him? Yeah, of course I asked. I'm I mean, like, I don't know. You might be yeah, like, yeah, I ain't yeah, getting yeah. that like, man business. What? I mean, he knew he was out. Like before that game, he knew he was out of New England going forward. I wonder what the hell he. Yeah, he, that's crazy. I wonder but what like, he do, this man. Is a, this is a mystery that Mal is going to be in Malcolm's book. So I, I, he, that's when I'm gonna learn it too. But I don't know. And I'm, do, I'm, I'm definitely really close. I honestly want to know what he did. Hopefully, we find out. So the latest NFL rumor is that Micah Parsons' behavior is reportedly worn thin within some of the Cowboys organization. Dad, I'll start with you first. Could you see the Cowboys trading a generational talent like Parsons? For what? <laughs> yeah. For who? What? War thin? Why? Because he's his own person and he has a personality and they want to bottle him up? I don't... What has he done? I mean, uh, other than try and produce on the field to help they sorry ass win some playoff games, outside of that, I mean, what has he really done? I mean, I get it. Yeah, yeah. He, he likes to talk and chirp and... He played in the NBA All-Star game that I didn't like because he's, he hadn't gotten his bag yet full of money. But he's going to be, whenever that time comes, he's going to be the highest paid defensive player in the history of the NFL. Mm -hmm. uh, does he need to play better down the stretch in the, in the regular season? Yeah, of course he does. But you're going to always get some vitriol, some jealousy, some negativity coming when your team isn't performing at a high level and you're supposed to be the guy. But no, you don't trade him. The Jets traded me for two number ones and they still can't figure out why and they still can't replace me. They still <laughs> looking for me. They still to this day, they hoping like hell Garrett Wilson continues to thrive. Then they just get somebody who they get in free agency. Uh, again, they still trying to replace me. <laughs> Period. Logan, Logan, what do you think about this situation? Yeah, I just think he's too valuable at too valuable of a position, man. I think the most valuable position of what they're paying nowadays is guys that can rush the passer and Micah does that on the highest levels and that is the Cowboys way. I mean, we're, he's getting us clicks, he's getting us entertainment, stuff to talk about. That's what the Cowboys do. Um, so I think, you know, you're going to get this fluff all around the draft, maybe to gauge a market if something were to happen. is Maybe they put it out there to see if a team bites on it. Um, but I don't know. Do you, do you trade like a top five pick overall or top ten pick for Michael Parsons or something like You'd that? You'd have to trade a lot. you got to get a lot for Michael Parsons. Yeah, I'm not trading. I'm not trading. Michael Parsons to pick up an unknown. Right. Just not doing that. Right. I know what he is. I know he's going to give me 13 sacks a year. Could be more. I know that for a fact. I know he's going to come to play. I know we got to set the defense to him. Our offense is better yet. Got to set the offense to him. Mm. They got to find him wherever he's at in pre-snap read. Oh, Micah's the Mike. Micah's this. Micah's that. Number 11's that. They got to find that. Why would I want to get that up? Right. Yeah, I don't. I mean, they're the Dallas has some some um, some payment options coming up here. They got to pay some guys. They got, they got it. They got CD. They got what are you gonna do with Dak? You got to pay Dak it. again. You got to pay. They got it, uh, Mike. And then what do you have outside of that? You got your old lines getting old. You got to pay Zach Martin. You got to pay Michael Parsons, CD Lamb, and make a decision on Dak Prescott. How much is that? But you got it. Two billion? How much? Does you got it. it. He got it. That's a lot of big names. You he know, got it. Now, I, from what I see with teams, they can't. They don't all keep it all. No, but he. It ain't like the Chiefs where they got you know. No, he keeps it though. He he has no problem paying players yeah. and kicking it down the road. Yeah, the can down the road. He's one of the few owners in the league that that I've known, having played for him, been around him. Watched him from years. He pays his players. Right. That's one thing. So you're giving CD Lamb thirty million a year. In a heartbeat, yesterday. Yeah. And Mike, he, Mike one of the is, top five pass catchers in the NFL. 
Michael Parsons is one of the top five defensive ends so he's in the NFL. Thirty five. So yeah, I'm Dax gonna spend. Getting, Dax getting a, re, a new one. See, Dax situation is such. I think that they they may be sitting and waiting to see. Let him play out this final year. Yeah, at that thirty million dollars that he's gonna get. But if he does what they think he could, that I think he's capable of doing, I'm gonna certainly give him fifty five million a year. Of real money though. Right. Not not fake money. I'm gonna give him real cash, like the rest of the top quarterbacks in the NFL. Because right. that's what he is. He's a top six quarterback. Right. So you're paying all that money, right, to those guys that need it, Zach Martin, Dak, CD, to have the same team that's been underperforming for the last okay, four years. It but is done. it the, the team? The same team. You got no new player. <laughs> but is it the same team, the same players, or is it the scheme? Is it all of a sudden Dan Quinn and what he was doing in his defense Moving Michael Parsons all over the place, where Michael Parsons should probably just line up and go get yeah, yeah, yeah. that guy on the other yeah, side, yeah. opposed to moving him to middle linebacker, putting his hand in the ground, dropping him in the third. Yeah. No, just too much. Yeah, well, they had, I mean, that game plan versus the Packers, I watched it on film, was not good. Not I mean, good. They had safeties playing linebacker. Safeties can do that, but they had no idea the run fits. They're 190 yeah, pounds. Yeah, that was not. That that was a no shot effort from the coaching point to the playing point, but I I thought it's going to be a you waited out to get uh to get Dion and and uh, Shador in there. They might do Ooh. that too. They might he might he might wait it out and get Shador and Dion in if 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 Dion would like to go coaching the pros. I don't know that he would. He you know it seems like he's enjoying college because if there was a team a if there was a team that he would coach in the pros, I think that would be the team. Where he could have that his, would be the his, closest his, his, availability. I mean, that would be the closest uh, team that possibly could have the availability that he would that I can see him coaching. I can see him coaching Atlanta, but they just hired a coach in Raheem. Yeah, but if that was available, I could see Atlanta. I could see the Cowboys for sure. Those are probably the two. Yeah, Houston, but they got somebody. Maybe an LA team or something. Nah, nah. I can't see him in L.A. He's more of a, well, McVay, a Texas yeah. South. Yeah, Maybe there's a Miami, Miami if that was available. That type of situation. Yeah, yeah. So, Logan, you famously intercepted Tom Brady's last throw as a Patriot and trolled him by asking him to autograph the ball. What was Brady's reaction to you wanting the ball signed? He was cool about it, man. He was he was actually in on it. Um, but, yeah, I had him. I had that ball laying around. I don't really do a lot. Like with my interception, but I keep them and I give them to family members. If I got a family member that's a fan of that team, I oh here, oh that's your team. Oh here's a ball. You know you a you you a Packers fan. Here's Aaron Rodgers. You were this fan. So I had that ball, kind of just literally in my office. And I said, man, I'm gonna get time to sign this. I don't know how many more games he's gonna play. So I snuck it in the kind of one of our last games. Like yo, I, I put some stuff because people put jerseys and stuff on next to his locker. And he'll 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 knock it out and sign him. But wait, how did you you intercepted the Tennessee Tennessee it, New England game in Foxborough? Yeah, it was his last game. His last so how pass did you get Patriot. him the ball? I got I kept it, and I was his teammate in Tampa. Oh, you was a year in Tampa. a year That's later. Right. Okay, so I came down to Tampa, and I still had the ball. Got it. So as we were kind of going through, and he, you know that was when he came out of retirement to play one last year, and we didn't, you know, so it was kind of like everyone put stuff on his chair to sign. So I snuck the ball in there with a note like, yo, can you just sign this one and date this one? And he was like, oh man, this is the this is my ball that, yeah, so I kind of <laughs> snuck it on here right here. No, I remember one backed up. Yeah. And, and it was a so. big six. Six or, yeah. Yeah. Last, la his last pass as a Patriot, I might auction that thing off one day. Never know if charity or something. Or, or just for me. I'm retired. I might need it. <laughs> so news broke last week that Bronny James is entering his name in both the NBA draft and the transfer portal. On Sunday, he posted a graphic of him and LeBron as teammates for the Lakers. So, Dad, do you think the Lakers should or will draft Bronny in this upcoming NBA draft? I think they should, number one. And I think they most likely would because... I mean, he wants to play with his son. And if he goes to the NBA draft, what you going to do? You going to tell LeBron no? I mean, they burn picks on dudes all day long that never even come over from overseas. Right. So they waste second and second round picks like it's nothing. And if, if he's not a first round talent and he wants to play with his father, then yeah, go ahead and do it. I don't, why not? You know me, I'm all, you behind the camera, so well, what does that tell you? you think he's physically ready for the NBA? I don't give a damn, you behind the camera, so what does that tell you? I'm going to do whatever yeah. I can for my son, period. <laughs> Nepotism is live in a well. Yeah. And 
in, <laughs> in, in, in the NBA circles, he's, he's ready for what level in the NBA, though? Are right. we asking him, look, he's never going to be a star. He's going to be a role player. That's what he's going to be. Okay? Ne you said never? If you're trying to compare him to his father. No, I'm not that. That's, that's, but see, that's, that's LeBron when you, James, when, but he'll never be like a... When you're talking about star players, you're talking about perennial yeah. all-stars, right? Yeah. You're talking about Steph Curry. You're talking about Devin Booker, KD, LeBron James, Anthony Davis, Ant-Man. Like, you're talking about... Yeah. At a he different don't got no level. Jalen Brunson in him. Well, Jalen Brunson is a, a scoring machine. Yeah, he's not a scorer. That's the that's the difference. He's a he would most likely be a defender. Mm -hmm. Has a nice body. He's obviously going to get stronger, bigger. He's got long arms. He could jump. He has some athletic ability. When you're looking at defensive players, lateral movement, side to side. Can they? Can he defend? The Ant Man's of the world and the Devin Booker's of the world. That's what we. That's what we gonna get him for. Yeah, that's what we paying him to do. That's what we paying him to do. We're not paying him to fill it up. Though Jalen Brunson is paid to fill it up. Yeah, he ain't paid to defend. Yeah. So there's a different different type of guard there. Yeah, and you know Jalen Brunson's winning national titles in college and 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 you know leading the tournament and scoring and stuff. So that's a Just different, different level, a thousand percent. Uh, Jalen Brunson's a little older coming out. Um, yeah, but I mean from a business standpoint, you have to draft him. Man, I'm drafting him. Are you drafting with the first with your first round pick? Well, I ain't no. say all that, but I'm just <laughs> I'm saying. I'm, I'm, hey, I'm, what if I'm, someone else? What if someone else is like, hey, but that's not gonna happen, bro. So, I don't. If, don't I don't think, think if I'm a drafted team, drafted by anyone. If you else have the them. if you have the twenty fifth overall pick, you no, but say, I don't think if Bron's coming. Well, see now you're saying something that the Lakers can do. Well, I, the Lakers ain't trying to lose LeBron, right? So we gonna sign him. We gonna draft him. But if you telling me that okay, so let's say let's play it this way, <laughs> LeBron James tells them. I want my son to be drafted with in the first round. Yeah. And the Lakers balk on it. Let's say they balk. Yeah, yeah, they balk on it, yeah. And if I'm LeBron, deuces. I'm gone. I'm getting ready to go to <laughs> Dallas. And yeah. I'm going to hook up with Luka and Kyrie. And I'm going to Dallas for the next three years of my son coming. That's right. the way I would play it. Yeah. That's the way I would play it. But I don't think he would give them that ult ultimatum to take him in the first round. And the reason other teams aren't going to take him in the first round is because everybody knows the desire for him to play with yeah, his son. Yeah. And so when you messing around with Clutch, which is represented by him, which he's part owner in, yeah, Rich and Paul. Rich Paul and a whole slew of NBA guys, at the end of the day, you kind of want to just stand pat. Don't yeah. get the messing up, talking about I'm a draft team. Don't do that. Yeah. And I mean, they could say no too, right? Like I'm sure LeBron and them would say, we're not going to any yeah, team but the saying, Lakers. But the Lakers or right. wherever I play. So how do you feel about NFL players doing that as well? If you got the, if you have the power to pull that, then go right ahead. I did you consider doing that? I told the New York Jets not to draft him. I told them <laughs> not to draft him. It's in my book. So I told them, don't draft me. <laughs> if you're gonna pay me like I'm the seventh pick of the draft, because they were trying to do a pre-draft deal. Yeah. They want to do it like they just for some reason. Felt that I just had to be in New York. I'm like, no, nah, I go to Jacksonville, number two, and get what I know I'm supposed to get, then go number one and have you just completely fuck me over. Right, so it wasn't slotted money-wise back then. You had to negotiate. Yeah, you had to negotiate yeah. your contract. So yeah. they was trying to give me seventh pick money to be the first overall pick. I'm like, no, nah, I'm yeah. good. I go to Jacksonville at two, and I already know I'm going to Jacksonville. Right. I know for 100% fact I'm going to Jacksonville. We already know. And they wind up drafting me on draft day. I told them don't. But if you have that power, man, you flex your muscles all day long because they going to do it to you. Exactly. 100%. Why you wouldn't do it to them? 100%. Yeah, I agree with that. Right? I mean, he behind the camera over there. <laughs> yeah, I ain't shy. Fourth time. I ain't shy. <laughs> I ain't shy about it at all. Fourth time. Yeah, for the fourth time, right, let yeah. them know. <laughs> <laughs> so, switching to women's basketball, Kaylin Clark has taken women's basketball to new heights. This season alone, she's rewritten college basketball record books. But Iowa didn't win the national championship. Shout out Don Staley. So I have to ask the question. Everyone's been debating the past few days. Does Caitlin Clark need a championship to be considered one of the greats? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Championships are team, are team one things. And she took her team and it took them to a potential level to beat a UConn, to beat a LSU. Iowa has no business beating LSU 
without Caitlin Clark, take them to the level. Do they, they even can believe that they can. Mm -hmm. Or to be a UConn who's more experienced, better roster, um, probably better coach. And then to beat a South Carolina last year. You know, I think she put so much belief in everyone around her. I mean, I'm watching the game. I know who Stokey is. I'm like, come on, Stokey, run that lane. Like, like I'm, I'm tuned in to them because Caitlin Clark has me watching. And I'm, I know their whole roster, like them girls have roles and they know they roles. And now they're knocking off some, some champs, some, some blue chip programs because she put so much belief in that entire state, mm -hmm. you know, what, you know, so I just think, no, absolutely not. She did everything that she was in her power to do, took it as far as she could. And I think she's going down as one of the greatest. Yeah. If, if, if you're saying that she's going to go down as, if your question is, does she go down as one of the greatest college basketball players Yes, the statistics would suggest that she goes down as one of the greatest basketball players ever. She went through a, a gauntlet of Colorados and the LSUs and the Yukons just to get to get knocked off by South Carolina. However, when you start talking about the GOAT, no, she's not the GOAT. She's just not. And that is because she does not have a ring. Mm. And when you are a GOAT, you got rings, or at least a ring. No one is having a conversation about somebody being the greatest at that particular sport if they hadn't delivered a championship. Although your championships or team game within the, within the confines of a team, it still doesn't matter if we're going to consider you the best that ever do it. You got to have a ring because everybody you would consider Think about Brianna Stewart. Uh, uh, I could go on and up. Cheryl Miller. I mean, I could just go on and on about girls uh, or people in general in sports that we consider the GOAT. We we don't consider in football Dan Marino the GOAT because Dan, Dan Marino won a championship. We consider Tom Brady the GOAT. We argue Joe Montana's the GOAT right. because they got championships. We argue that Patrick Mahomes is going to eventually surpass uh, uh, Tom Brady as a GOAT because he will probably win more championships and MVPs. So it's hard to give her that GOAT status of all time, the greatest of all time, and you haven't won a championship. That's just, that'll, that's going to be a hard one to give. I mean, I think it's different with college and, and pro sports. Pro sports, you got a professional roster around you, mm -hmm. right? In college, you're not picking your teammates. They're getting recruited from the same state. You know, these guys that have won championships, their team is just so much better than a the guy they're playing against. But they might be playing against a guy or a woman or a female girl that Caitlin Clark's the best player in the world, but she don't have the best team, right? Yeah, and it's I, not like you're saying, oh, well, these guys that we consider the GOAT in football and Mahomes or Brady and this and Dan Marino didn't do it. Like, these, these guys have paid rosters to do that. They stick together. They stick in an organization for 10 years. She got four years to come in. Hope she got a good freshman class with her. Right, you don't know who the seniors were that are with her. You can go get a ring in college with a loaded senior class. Yeah, but right? you're not going to be considered two years on a two year run at the level that she Logan has been on. No one is going to say she, they're going to say she's one of the greatest players of all time. But when you're talking about the goat, Diana Taurasi, I believe, has three or four. Oh yeah, like it's just hard. Yeah, I mean, this, U, this UConn team, men just went back to back. I can't tell you who a guy on their roster, and then, that, and, and, they, they might have four when they're done, but I don't mean... They will never go down right. as <laughs> the greatest UConn, I mean, go down as the greatest basketball program in college history. They will, we had, I had this conversation earlier, conversation earlier. Do you know what the 1990 UNLV running Rebels they wiped the floor with that team last night. Yeah. With Stacey Augman and Larry Johnson and Greg Anthony and Anderson Hunt and David Butler. Man, they wiped the floor with them. Even the Fab Five that did not win a championship. Man, they would run shop on UConn. I could go on and on and on. Right. Georgetown, 84. You probably you weren't even born then. In 84, they had this dude named Michael Graham, Patrick Ewing, uh, Michael Jackson, Reggie Williams, and they went up against Akeem Olajuwon in a five slammer jammer. <laughs> I sound old, but yeah, yeah, it's the truth. He said five slammer jammer. Oh, man. The 90s, no, no, no. I could go. I could go into the two thousands <laughs> if you really want me to dive into that. But that, but what I'm all I'm saying yeah, is, yeah, you got to cap it off. With you got to cap it off. 
I think she's in the Mount Rushmore, obviously. I, I don't, you know, Cheryl Miller, and I don't know all their numbers to know who Yeah, it's a that bunch of them, be, man. You right? got Candace you know, Parker that's hard to do. and Cheryl Miller right. and Cheryl Swoops. I yeah, mean, like, yeah. people be like, yeah. nah. But she's definitely up there, man. She is, like, generationally. Yeah, she ridiculous. She though. might be Allen Iverson in her era. She changed the game. Well, she changed right. the game for right. sure. Right, she changed like the game Steph from Curry. a culture. Steph, Curry, Steph yeah. Curry, yeah. Just like that. Right, but... You know, people might not put him ahead of Magic because of the rings, but did he not change the game in a way that now look at all these kids, how they play? That's what she did for Oh, him. no, he completely changed the game as how they play. And, and Steph got, what does Steph have, four? Four. Yeah, yeah. Magic have five, I think. Four or five. But but Magic was a 6'9 point guard. Uh, yeah. So when he came into the league at 6'9", you never seen a 6'9 dude run yeah. the floor like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I'm old, so. <laughs> so, Logan, uh, we wanted to talk about your foundation. You co-founded Ryan Animal Rescue Foundation with your wife, Ashley. Can you tell us more about that and how it helps people and how people can help? <laughs> <laughs> the dog's at. Yeah, man. Um, uh, I run a big animal foundation. We raise money, awareness for shelter animals, encourage people to rescue and adopt um, instead of breeding and all that stuff, and I know it's different culture where you're from, but there's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot of pets and shelters that uh, need a home, you know. So give them a look first if you can. And uh, my wife, um, early in our, you know, relationship, she she took a job at an animal shelter and she was doing the dirty work, man, to pay her side of the bills, and that's what she wanted to do. <laughs> uh, very independent, and I, I I thought that was really cool of her. So I would stop by and I started to see these animals and throw them up on my Instagram to help them get adopted kind of grew into a thing. So, you know, animals is my cause. A lot of animal people are good people. They're people I kind of vibe with. And I bring my kids uh, to the shelter. We volunteer at the shelter, teach my kids responsibility through that. Um, so yeah, we're at our local shelter all the time, walking dogs, taking them out, you know, get, let them get some run, put them on my Instagram, help them get adopted because, you know, they need a, need a home. It's just not, it's not just dogs though. No, they, cats, dogs, anything, anything you find in the shelter, animals in general. And obviously with COVID, um, you know, we help people with dog food to be able to afford to keep their pets. Because sometimes financially, if you got to make tough decisions, you might not have enough money to feed your... your, your Man, you know, don't your, even tell me nothing about no damn tough decision on no dogs. Yeah, so I had a... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you laughing. Be you know, serious. The two little, the two little uh, Palmer... Or what is it? Palm boy. <laughs> multi-poos. <laughs> multi-poos. Yeah, yeah what multi-poos. What do you think of David Portnoy's rescue pit bull, Miss Peaches, Logan? Say that again? I said, what do you think of David Portnoy's rescue pit bull, Miss Peaches? Oh, yeah. I, I think I saw that, man. I think it's awesome, man. Um, he's got a huge following, obviously. <laughs> and, uh, you know, pit bulls get, get a negative stigma a lot. Um, so I think, I think anybody highlighting their personal life, and you know, their pets. I mean, pets are family members nowadays, man. You got to love your dogs. And, and I think what Dave Portnoy did, I think that was pretty dope for the cause. Man, you know, it was just here. My, one of my little... One of my little Oh, wow. Yeah, they, they, the, the coldest. They on, he showed me a picture on the PJ, by the way. Oh, <laughs> stop, man. Stop, man. Stop, man. Stop. Stop, man. On stop, the stop, dog stop, was stop. on the PJ. Stop, man. We got to travel with him. What, what, what else you going to do? Look at him. He just, he lounging He's in his chilling, chair. Yeah. So we got two yeah, of these. You, you get it. You get but it, But at man. the end of the day, no, I get it. But I, we, me and my son was laughing because it was a tough call. So we got two multi pools and the coldest hustle in the game to me, out of all hustles, that. The water game is a hustle. Yeah. This is one of the ultimate hustles. Something that we can get for free. They put in a plastic bottle and they sell it to you. But the coldest game is the veterinarian Bad. game, man. Oh, yeah. I'm man. just telling you. They charge what they want. Oh, man. We had an issue. <laughs> Our dog had um, kidney stones. So he had kidney stones a year ago to the date. And so we have insurance, but our insurance didn't cover it all. Yeah. So we had to pay for it. Okay, cool. Whatever this first time around. So now, second time come around, they reemerge, kidney stones. I'm like, well, I thought we got rid of that before. So, you know, me, I'm like, oh, you know, they call me and the first thing they say is, oh, the dog, this, that, it went to the vet, they got the kidney stone issues. I'm like, well, what did they say? They said, we got to make this decision. Either we going to pay this or put it down. You know, me, I'm yeah. like, hey, you want, we can buy five dogs with that. <laughs> but, but then at the end of the day, they get you emotional. She, uh, yeah, my kids. Yeah, they tell me no. The that yeah, you're so man. mean. <laughs> you're a mean dad. I'm like, what you mean? Like this is it your school tuition. It gets expensive. And then man. all of a sudden, I just said, all right, whatever, man. Y'all make y'all make the decision on what y'all want to do. I put it back on them. So then they went ahead and had the surgery again. Yeah. But it's just like, man, I should have been a veterinarian. Well, you don't know dogs have ACLs, right? 
Yeah. So I, I, I adopted my pity. He had a bad hip. I knew he needed a hip surgery or they're going to put him down. So I, I saw the case. I was yeah. like, I'm going to help this dog out. So I adopted my dog, Leo, uh, at a blue pit, and I paid for his hip surgery, got him right. So he come out the hip surgery, you know, wobbling a little bit, get him right, strengthen his back legs up. Boom, six months later, he jog and go to catch a ball, jump up, boom, blows a knee out. AC so I take him to the vet, ACL. I didn't even know dogs had ACL. Yeah, got ACL. <laughs> ACL. Boom, I pay for the ACL. They like, look, we're just telling you there's a good chance the other ACL gonna go. Two years later, boom, other ACL. And he ain't going to no normal vet. He going to the, the top ACL no, vet in yeah. Boston. Yeah. I'm in Number the one, He going to James vet. Andrews, who did Aaron Rodgers Achilles ACL for vet. So I'm paying a, a specialist. <laughs> he got an underwater treadmill recovery routine. They have laser, they was doing laser therapy on him. Man. So he was, the, the bill was getting high. So he did both ACLs, the hip. So then one of the one of the plates they put in his leg got infected. His leg blew up. <laughs> he almost died. So I had to Man. get him. So I'm calling my financial advisor, like, you know, you gotta call him on a big purchase. You know, that's how I set it up. Keep me in check. So I'm like, hey man. He's like, the dog again? I'm like, yeah, man. He's like, you gotta do it. You're in this deep. I say, yep. So Leo has cost me close to twenty thousand dollars in surgeries from, no, from all the legs. It's it yeah, it's and, expensive. And uh, my man's still kicking eleven years in. But he, but I'm happy, man. I, I I don't regret it at all. You remember, see, Keyshawn, the first time we got his, we had the surgery. He came home. He was in his his uh, little thin cone on his face, so he doesn't yeah. uh, bite himself or lick himself and all that, right? So check this out, though, Logan. I come home. I'm like, where the fuck is the dog at? <laughs> dog, one dog is there. The other dog ain't at home. So I'm like, okay, I called Jen. I'm like, do you have the dog with you? She goes, no, they're at home. I'm like, at home where? So I run all over our house, upstairs, downstairs, all over the place, down, the basement, area. Just I'm looking for the dog. Now, we live in the mountains. And ain't nothing in the mountains but wildlife. Yeah. Coyotes, coyotes. and, coyotes and, and oh, no. mountain lions and bobcats. They, so I'm looking for the dog. The dog done literally left our house and walked about a quarter of a mile down to the front gate where the security shack is at. He done took his ass and walked down to the front. <laughs> and in that time, a coyote could have got him and munched him up. And I had just spent a bunch of money getting him <laughs> no, in the surgery. Right. I, mean, I was money. so damn mad. He about his investment. Man, <laughs> I was so bad, <laughs> man. But no, nah, that's just some dog uh, stories. I appreciate you. Yeah. I appreciate uh, you I love for joining. animals, man. I love my animal people. Yeah, no. It's, it, I, I like my dogs. It, it, they're expensive, but... You know, no, it's people. crazy. You said, so are kids. You said kids they were gonna put put your dog down for uh, a hip, like because he had a bad hip. Well, he was in a he was in a shelter. It's a big dog, and he had this this uh, pretty much a broken hip, and he couldn't really walk. So yeah. he really was just no one was adopting him. So yeah. after a while, they was thinking about putting him down, to create more space. Like he's mm -hmm. not adoptable, right? No one wants to inherit. Oh, I want to adopt this pit bull. There's all a bunch of pit bulls. Get this one. And he's going to cost you this much. Yeah. So yeah. I kind of, you know, stepped in and, and, and was the one to help save him. And, and man, that dog's been the best. That is our best family dog. We got a couple dogs and he has been our best and dog. And you probably feed me chicken and rice and peas. And he, he went to the penthouse. He's living good, man. He, <laughs> he's on a special diet now, but um, yeah, man, it was, it was awesome. I took that dog on TV. All, everything with my foundation, we've been on billboards together. He's been, you know, the, the poster boy for what I do and, and try to help. You know, you get breed discrimination. When you try to rent an apartment, they don't let you rent it if you have a pit bull, right? Certain dogs, they don't let you be a renter. Really? Yeah, I, I got turned that. down by like 20 different spots. I was trying to rent in New, New Jersey, New York because I had a pit bull. Oh, I didn't know that. So it no was idea. like, you know, we were trying to like, man, it's messed up, man. So I went, of course, me, if I have a problem, I'm going to air it out. So I'm like, you know, trying to tell people, man, do y'all struggle with this too? Like, do you struggle? Trying? Everyone's like, yeah, man, I couldn't rent a place for a year because my dog, they kicked me out because my dog. So I was like, man, they, they hate on certain dogs. All right, man. Right. Thanks, man. Logan, thanks for Appreciate joining you, the show. I had a fun. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's a wrap for today's show. Thanks again to Logan Ryan for joining the show. Don't forget to subscribe and follow All Facts Pod on social media. Until then, peace out. Stay out your ass out of trouble. <laughs>